So the, the methods clusters are one component of um, the portfolio of work that the BC support unit um, has led over the past few years. Um, the, the focus of the methods clusters is really building the science of patient-oriented research, which um, has, has been work that I've had the fortune of coming into and seeing a very thoughtful approach to how the, the doing of patient-oriented research has been expanded. Next slide. Um, the, the work of the methods clusters builds on a few interrelated principles. Um, first, that the focus is on improving the way we do patient-oriented research, um, addressing gaps in research, and I'll talk about uh, a little bit more about the different areas of research that have been explored, and then building new methods for how we do, how we do research and, and do it differently. Um, but we also wanted to do this in a patient-oriented uh, patient oriented way. So how do we both study as well as do patient-oriented research? Um, so it, it really is this ability to expand how we think about different areas of research in partnership with patients, um, caregivers, and, um, and communities. Uh, it, part of two um, is also listening to the communities about what areas of research are important to explore. Um, so we actually fund uh, or have six uh, clusters, methods clusters. Today's presentation is going to be on patient-centered measurement, but I just wanted to take a moment to recognize there are five others. There's a group that focuses on real-world clinical trials, uh, patient engagement, patient engagement uh, knowledge translation and implementation science, data science and health informatics, and health economics and simulation modeling. So each cluster has uh, worked within their communities of researchers and uh, patient representatives um, to identify what the priorities um, for their respective fields of work should be, and then advance um, uh, various uh, topics of research in their own respective groups. So next slide. So since inception, I mentioned the six clusters of, um, of focused work. There have been 42 projects across the different research clusters that have been funded to explore different aspects of research in a patient-oriented way. As part of this, we've engaged with over 100 patients as part of not only the prioritization for topics that should be explored, but also in the conduct of research. Um, and this is equated to just under $5 million awarded in funds um, for this research to move forward. Next slide. So each, as I mentioned before, each method cluster has gone about their own different journey for identifying what the priorities are, um, the number of research uh, projects that they funded, and the amount of awards that they have, have administered. Um, so our patient-centered measurement isn't the biggest cluster health economics actually is, um, but they've had 10 different projects, which we'll speak to briefly um, in a moment with about a little over a million dollars going into this area of research. And I would offer that um, patient-centered measurement, and we'll, you'll hear more of my bias later today, is, is this great opportunity as we look forward to more person-centered healthcare when we think about what are the measures that are important to people and how do we better integrate that into the decisions that we make in the context of healthcare. So next slide. And this actually gives me the opportunity to pass the baton over to Rick. Um, Rick and Lena, as I have indicated, have um, led this work since its inception. Um, and Rick will speak to the work that they were charged with and how it's unfolded over the past few years. So Rick, I will pass it to you. Great. Thanks very much, Danielle. And um, yes, I'm, I'm Rick Sawatsky. I'm joining from the unceded territories of the Semiamo First Nations. That's uh, close to Crescent Beach in White Rock, just south of Vancouver, uh, which is where I live, learn, and work. And uh, I'm joining you from our, our home in that location, my outdoor office, uh, where it is now pouring <laughs> rain. Um, but uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share uh, collectively our work that we've been doing with the methods cluster over the past couple of years. And our mandate, our work focuses on the mandate of advancing the science of patient-centered measurement for BC and beyond. Uh, it's quite a, a high uh, bar to achieve, but hopefully we have made some progress in that direction. Uh, one of our guiding principles that is important to keep in mind, of course, it's a guiding principle for all scientific advancement, but it's actually really important here because there's decades of scientific work that has been done on patient-centered measurement methods, many decades. And we wanted to make sure that we're not going to do things that we invent the wheel, but that we build on existing knowledge in the field of patient-centered measurement, particularly 
uh, contributing uh, from a patient-oriented research point of view, addressing the concern that much of what's been done under the umbrella of patient-centered management has been critiqued as not actually being framed from a patient-oriented point of view or being done with appropriate patient engagement. So our, the first thing we set out to do was we interviewed 14 uh, um, stakeholders from various areas in the world, UK, Australia, US, Canada, and some other areas um, to, uh, to come up, and we did an in-depth literature review to get some sense of what do we actually mean by patient centered measurement. Um, and of course, we don't come up with a definitive definition but we felt we needed to have something to start with in order to then engage the stakeholder community in appropriate ways, especially communicating that measurement is not just the technicality, but it involves an entire process. And so this is what, what we came up with. We worked with a graphic designer, artist, to come up with a visual. And uh, to accentuate that the measurement needs to be scientifically rigorous. Uh, in order to achieve valid um, conclusions about experiences of care and outcomes of care. But it's not only just about uh, doing the surveys, but it's also about transforming that information into data that can be quantified, validated, and that identifies areas of concerns and priorities for patients. And then once we have the data, it's not enough to stop there either. We need to translate that data into information, knowledge and information that can actually be used in meaningful ways. And important here is to point out that there's different users who have different uh, needs, uh, different um, purposes for using patient-centered measurement data. Um, these include patients, of course, but also healthcare providers, quality improvement teams, policy makers, researchers, and so on. And then, of course, our ultimate goal is for this information to lead to improved quality of life, uh, which includes or through better care, better health, and better use and access to resources, which then feeds back into uh, the, the cyclical process of doing patient-centered measurement. So this is kind of the, the, the conceptualization that we're bringing forward in, in kind of how we've been thinking about patient-centered measurements as we engage the cluster. Um, also, we thought about patient measurement about around kind of three key questions that have arisen through some knowledge translation initiatives that we've done with stakeholders. But I just want to point out the key questions here uh, which actually really drives it home. Patient reported outcomes are about how is your care uh, or, or how are you doing? I mean, how are you doing in various aspects of your life in terms of your health outcomes? And patient reported experiences are about how is your care, how you're experiencing your care, of course. And then, of course, we want to ultimately get at what matters to you so that that can be addressed. And in this slide, we frame those as building blocks together with performance indicators and clinical outcomes of person-centeredness. But at the same time, of course, we could view them as build, building blocks of a learning health system. And so I've already defined these, so I'm going to move on. And I think I'm speaking to an audience who is quite familiar with these measures. Uh, the other thing that I just briefly wanted to point out before we go to the next of introducing the, 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 the themes, stakeholder engagement that we did and the themes that we came up with is this idea that patient-centered measurement occurs at different levels of healthcare, a point of care, it's, uh, that's a micro level, it occurs at the, at the MAC and MISO levels for quality improvement types of purposes. So those are the organizational levels. And it also occurs at the healthcare system level for macro level decision making, surrounding policy and so on. And it's important to keep in mind that we have these different framings of patient-centered measurement that all come together under this common umbrella with different stakeholders. And so um, the motivation really for the cluster was in part to get at uh, promoting the use of patient-centered measurement in a scientifically rigorous way. And we're addressing the concern that there's decades of research 
and uh, knowledge about the use of patient reported outcomes and patient reported experience measures uh, over four decades of work being done on that, tons of studies, and yet the uptake is perhaps not as large as one would expect. And why is that? And so we framed our work around focusing on knowledge engage and knowledge translation through engagement of diverse stakeholders with a specific focus on the need of methodological advancement. And that brings us to the, the next step in our, our patient uh, or centered measurement cluster work, which was to engage broadly across stakeholders in British Columbia. We held stakeholder consultations uh, through focus groups with a total of 74 patients of different locations. You can see in the dots uh, up to where the patients came from. So they're really spread throughout BC. We went to each of the health authorities and had um, uh, health regions basically, and had uh, separate focus groups in their local locations. And we also, through a similar process, engaged with uh, 96 stakeholders, including academics, analysts, researchers, clinicians, and healthcare leaders. And through that process, we uh, um, came up with uh, what we believe to be a representation of, of what, or what we heard from these stakeholders about what the priorities for patient-centered measurement methods in BC are. And so we identified 11 priority areas. And you know, we're still doing analyses on how to collate and how to thematically represent this best. But these are the areas that, that informed our um, patient-centered measurement research projects. And I'm going to talk about each of these areas next, just very briefly. Um, but before doing so, uh, as I said, the way we engage then uh, the, the uh, people to conduct research is we held then uh, after those workshops and stakeholder engagement um, uh, focus groups. After that, we held a webinar uh, that invited everybody across the province who was interested in being leading or being involved in patient-centered measurement research. And we presented those 11 themes and invited proposals. And then we worked with each of the teams, which obviously included researchers, clinicians, uh, other stakeholders, and of course, patients as central as a core team member in each of the projects. We worked with each of those teams to craft their proposals to address uh, in the best way uh, what, with the resources available, um, these kind of priority areas. And these are the 10 projects that ultimately were funded. And I'll briefly refer to them as we move along. So, uh, well, and you can go to the website uh, that Danielle has just posted. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> uh, um, uh, for, uh, in, which provides a paragraph description of each of these projects. If you wanna know more of the project, I'm not going to say much about the projects themselves. Um, so what did we hear from patients and stakeholders? Well, one of the themes that came across loud and clear was the idea of measurements needing to be patient-driven, not just patient-centered, but actually patient-driven. Uh, so that brings a slightly different um, focus uh, where the patients are in the driver's seat. Uh, a lot of patient-centered care is done by researchers or by healthcare providers under the umbrella of being for patients, but that's actually not being done by patients or driven by patients. And so that's represented by this quote. We have many more quotes, of course. I think historically patients haven't been involved in creating these tools or our voice wasn't there to begin with. And recently, even in the literature, in the uh, research literature, we've seen publications come out highlighting concerns about patients not being adequately involved in these patients' uh, uh, reported outcome and experience measurement and tools and their design and their use. So that's the first theme. The second theme uh, that we sought to address through the methods research 
um, and that we heard from patients and stakeholders as being a priority is giving a voice to patients, but not only patients, also their family caregivers and their communities. Um, and here is the quote. If you rattle off a bunch of numbers to me, that doesn't mean anything. That's not giving a voice. But if that is encompassed in a story, then it's more relatable. Then it's something I will remember. I won't remember that 92% of people said blah, 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 but I will remember the story that's we. So this attention of bringing life to what we're actually measurement, in other, measuring. In other words, there's a whole science and field of qualitative measurements. Uh, measurements, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but measurements uh, from a philosophical point of view does not need to include numbers. Um, can be qualitative as well. And that's what this speaks to in this theme. The next theme had to do with patients feeling safe. In fact, in each of our focus groups, we had people in tears because they did not feel safe. Safe about how their data was used and how it was going to, or safe about concerns about how their data was going to be used and how it would impact their care or their access to care. So here's the quote. We can tell you, but you are are you going to listen? And how are you going to listen? Are you going to listen through a lens that has a predetermined outcome or understanding? Or are you going to try and really open up and listen and try to comprehend what is being said? And of course, this relates to the previous theme of around our measurements, there need to be stories and understandings of what this actually means. Um, the fourth theme has to do with measurement tools that are individualized or tailored for diverse patients and population. In the research world, this in, uh, in, uh, addresses the concern about what's often referred to as nomothetic measurement. Nomothetic measurement focuses on what matters to the general populace, but it doesn't necessarily entail what matters to this individual person or this community of people or this particular context. And so a shift from nomothetic measurement to focusing on what matters to individuals by tailoring to uh, the needs and context of diverse patients and population. The us is exemplified in this quote. Society in general has a bias that affects all marginalized groups, that we look at somebody in a wheelchair from the perspective of someone who can walk. We look at gay and lesbian people from the perspective of people who are straight. We look at folks who have disabilities, be they physical or cognitive, from the perspective of somebody who is normal. So patient-centered measurement needs to be tailored. The next theme has to do with methods for enhancing representation of marginalized, uh, vulnerable, or hard-to-reach populations, whereas the previous theme had to do with how do we measure the, the theme here focuses on how do we ensure that people are well represented in our measurements. And this in, uh, uh, is exemplified by the following quote. There are challenges in why certain people don't want to talk. There is a reason. Here's a doctor and a nurse saying, tell me, tell me, tell me, Tell me your story. That just triggers in me a response like, get out of my face. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm scared. I want to run. This is not a First Nations issue. It's a people issue. We're all being traumatized, okay? So that was a quote from, from one of the people um, uh, in, our, in our focus groups. Um, and of course, it relates to the big problem with First Nations and our desire to be treated equitably and equally in healthcare as another, as another um, uh, quote from one of the people. And then there's a piece of measuring across journeys of care. A lot of measurement focuses on one particular context in isolation of other contexts. We have measures that focus on particular disease groups or measures that focus on particular sectors of care, not realizing or not taking into account that most people have most multiple diseases or chronic conditions 
and not taking into account that most people traverse across multiple sectors of care. And so this is the journey of care. We need to measure the journey of care. Huge potholes. If I wasn't on it all the time, I would still not be taken care of. It was like they weren't talking to each other. I was like, I'm this specialist. I'll look at that. I'm this specialist and I'll look at that. And there was no continuity. So this piece of continuity and exchange across different contexts of care, we need measurements that will able to facilitate that. The first and one of our most important themes, I think, uh, uh, certainly in terms of the, the number of projects that we have engaged with, is this focus on indigenous methodologies for patient-centered measurement. We've learned a lot from our indigenous communities around building stories about around measurements and how to measure in ways that are culturally safe and respectful and that we represent uh, the needs of different and, and perspectives of diverse people. Here's the quote. One of the things that came to mind firstly was a two-eyed team concept. So that if you're working with indigenous First Nations people, the Western way of doing, and then the traditional way as well, because the days of coming in with all the knowledge are saying, this is what you need. We're going to save you, colonize your culture. Those days are long gone. So a two-eyed seeing approach honors the ways in both knowledge, of no, both knowledge they see. And so we've actually funded three projects uh, worth almost a half a million dollars focused specifically on indigenous methodologies for patient-centered measurement. Um, the eighth theme focuses on improving the use of data. We don't measure for the sheer delight of measurements, although measurements could be an enjoyable process, I suppose, but really we'd measure with a purpose. And this draws attention to um, we need to emphasize those purposes of use and capacitate people to use measurements in meaningful ways, PCN data in meaningful ways. And so this is a knowledge translation theme. And we have a knowledge translation project that focuses squarely on this particular theme. So each of the projects, of course, are a form of integrated knowledge translation in and of themselves. So the goal is not reporting it provincially, and ticking your box for the hospital versus a GP office. It's actually to get the information to the hands of the individuals who need that feedback to modify their behavior and thus improve care. The ninth theme has to do with integration of patient reported data with clinical and administrative data. In fact, when we had during some of our stakeholder consultations, stakeholders mentioned that while well, patients uh, a centered measurement doesn't need to be only patient reported data. And of course, that is right. We have many uh, forms of uh, um, uh, patient generated data that are not necessarily patient um, reported data. And so this focuses on bringing all the forms of data, including administrative health data and clinical data together and integrating that. Um, and here is a quote. I think a lot of this highlights the relationship between a patient's goals and our clinical goals and how they are interpreted when they come together. To me, it's an intersection of where they come together as to how we apply this in our practice. This is clearly a clinician a quote from a clinician, but it speaks to the foundations of, of shared decision-making uh, to improve uh, person-centered care. The 10, and next to last theme is about advancing methods for ensuring PCM accurately reflects what is important to patients. And um, this has to do with accuracy. This has to do with addressing measurement issues, including potential biases uh, that may creep in in how we actually measure. So the quote is, so it's kind of multiple stage. The first is to do, to is how do we make people comfortable with providing honest feedback? And then how do we use that feedback to create change? So this is about the methods of, of obtaining uh, accurate information that is um, uh, with minimal bias. And that's transparent. 
valid, relevant, secure importance. And then the final theme has to do more with the technology of patient-centered measurement, developing and implementing of innovative technology. And we have several projects focusing on this that include uh, a project, for instance, in uh, people with um, struggling with blood pressure and blood pressure clinics that include um, uh, regular blood pressure monitoring, merging that with patient-centered measurement data to, uh, to arrive at, at um, um, shared decision-making. Whereas often the decision-making traditionally has been, you know, the blood pressure value itself is the guiding data uh, form of measurement. But now it's measurement, that's blood pressure measurement together with other, for other aspects of um, patient experience and patient's outcomes. It's so important not to ignore people who don't have digital communication. There's a lot of us. So this quote brings attention to the notion that, okay, there's a lot of drive, of course, to make patient-centered measurements available into online systems through widespread integration. But we got to also recognize that many of those systems are not as readily accessible uh, to all people. And so this theme is designed to address that. So I'm going to leave it there because once I start talking, time just flies by. So I'm going to cut myself short here. But just to say that there's really two kind of key thing, things that we're trying to engage, uh, address. One has to do with this piece of knowledge translation and engaging all stakeholders in the process, which is key. And the other has to do with focusing on methodological advancements that are critical to enhancing fairness and equity in, for patient-centered measurements in diverse populations. So I'm next going to turn it over to Lena, who's going to say, uh, talk about, um, Lena Cuthbertson, who's going to talk about the, the role of the Office of Patient-Centered Measurement and that work that's done with, because that office is a central partner with this patient-centered measurement methods cluster, uh, and also give a, a demonstration of, of, of how we've been using patient-centered measurement data. So, Nina, on to you. Nina, we can't Nina, hear. you might be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about yeah. that. All of our, all of our tech, uh, tech problems that uh, still exist 18 months after uh, the start of the pandemic. Um, so I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share with you the work that uh, we've done in British Columbia. I'm calling in from the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, um, where I live, work, play, and I like, Rick, that you add learn, um, and today <laughs> learning together with you. Um, in the shadow of the two sisters, what's now um, called uh, Lion's Bay, and today I happen to be in a greater shadow because I'm calling in from Gambier Island. Um, I have to say that um, the work that I've had the absolute pleasure of participating in with this gift of funds that Rick and I received from the BC Support Unit and the absolute pleasure of learning from um, Rick um, has been some of the most exciting work in, in my career. And I hope that in this presentation, we've been able to share with you through the work that we did together starting in 2018 to identify from the perspective of patients and also uh, researcher stakeholders um, the priorities for advancing the science of patient-centered measurement. And so what I'd like to share with you today is um, the fact that this work that we do in British Columbia, which we call patient-centered measurement, has evolved over time. And really, when I look, Rick, at what you've presented today um, and some of the priorities that were identified in late 2018, early 2019 through our engagement, I think that the COVID pandemic has put an even greater spotlight on some of these areas. So the very last uh, priority area around the use of technology, well, haven't we learned that there's not equity in access to virtual health, um, even though 
the application of um, virtual technologies can be such a gift for people in rural and remote areas. And not to mention the spotlight that COVID has placed on um, tailoring measurement and even putting the spotlight on what we measure and how we measure in terms of the lens through equity. So I, I say all this because I'm very proud of the fact that um, I've worked with this um, in this field of patient-centered measurement for almost two decades, and that I can honestly say I wake up every morning um, and think that what we're going to do today might not be exactly the same as was it, what it was yesterday. So our work was, in fact, in British Columbia, the formalized patient-centered measurement was established in 2002. And for those of you who may be familiar with the history of our structure in British Columbia for healthcare service delivery, a very important thing happened in December of 2001 at midnight on December 12, 2001. And that was when the British Columbia Ministry of Health dissolved our 52 health boards with their 250 um, hospitals and formed our health authority structure with one provincial and five regional health authorities with the articulated goal of making our healthcare system more patient-centered. First Nations Health Authority, which was the first health authority of its kind in um, Canada, wasn't formed until 2013, but as soon as they came on board, they joined this collaborative initiative, which we say is Ministry of Health supported and health authority Led. Um, next slide, Greg. So the mandate of our steering committee, which has also slightly evolved over time, really began with the goal of being able to measure and um, put the perspective of people who use healthcare um, services um, uh, as a metric that would be seen as equal to other clinical and administrative data. And so that the patients of British Columbia would have a voice in assessing the quality and safety of our healthcare system through a provincially coordinated, so it's all in, no cherry picking, everyone has to be involved, cost efficient because these are very large scale projects and also scientifically rigorous. What we realized was that in British Columbia, there were a lot of homegrown tools and what we wanted to do was to ensure the scientific rigor in that first step of the PCM definition that um, Rick um, uh, described, which is PREMS and PROMS being scientifically rigorous surveys and assessments. And initially we started our work thinking, well, if we measured how satisfied people were, we would be done. And we very quickly realized that that only provided global ratings and never pointed the finger at exactly what it was about people's experiences that we needed to um, work on. Um, and uh, over time, we've evolved that work even to start to look at key drivers. What are the key experiences that are going to drive improvement in overall satisfaction? And we could have a whole webinar on that, couldn't we, Rick? Um, but the other thing that we evolved to was this, um, uh, I guess, uh, mantra that Rick and I use that PREMS plus PROMS equals better together, um, that we began to also ask people not only about their satisfaction, their overall global ratings of satisfaction, not only did we ask them to tell us about what, how their care was, their care experiences, but we also asked them to tell us about their health status. Our work initially was focused on enhancing public accountability, so data collected for performance measurement and accountability but also in what we were unique in British Columbia in um, sampling at the level of the um, location of care so that it would support local QI and evaluation. And it wasn't until we got access to our support unit funding that we also started looking at how do we collect data and make it available to inform research. So our um, mandate um, is this coordinated cost of fit effective, scientifically rigorous program, but always with the uh, guiding principle that uh, at the heart of every data point in healthcare as a person. Next slide, Rick. So these are our guiding principles, and uh, you'll get these slides after, so I won't go into them in detail. But what I do want to share 
is that the initiative always was intended to minimize the data collection burden on the health authorities. And that was um, part of the rationale for our provincially coordinated uh, work. Um, but you'll also see that, you know, we have expanded our work to um, work with uh, an Indigenous um, uh, advisory committee looking at how do we support culturally safe care. So many of the priorities that Rick identified um, that uh, we had found through our engagement have been reflected in the guiding principles for how we undertake this provincial work. Next slide. And really that the strategy and process for this work is very complex and will continue to evolve over time. So one of the things that I wanna focus on today is the piece of this um, uh, graphic that is our definition of patient-centered measurement that focuses on how do we take the data that we collect through patient-centered measurement and translate it into information so that it can be available for various different stakeholders? And how can we ensure that the information that we provide um, leads to what you will recognize here as the triple aim so that it will it result in better quality of life for people because we've provided better care, better health, and better use of our resources. And the evolving nature of our work is the fact that the arrow goes right back to the beginning. So if you go to the next slide, Rick, people will see that our value chain is really reflective of this evolution and the constant cyclical nature of our work. We never um, develop a survey instrument uh, with the goal of being scientifically rigorous if there's a ready to wear, I call them ready to wear tools. So we do a review of the literature, de a de determine that there's a need for a survey instrument, and we look at whether there's already a good one out there. Um, only if we don't find one, or only if it doesn't meet all of our needs, do we develop and test and um, uh, provide additional questions. Then we do the data collection, the processing, and the reporting. And my presentation today is gonna to focus on this reporting piece and some of the lessons that we've learned. And we also have a role in sharing results and action planning. Next slide, Rick. So this just shows the uh, scope of the different uh, sectors that we've surveyed in. So a total of 13 sectors and subsectors. And uh, one of the guiding principles on the slide that we showed earlier was that the goal is that we would trend um, scores over time so that we would be able to see if we're in fact moving the needle by all of this work that we're doing by engaging with patients to provide feedback. Next slide. The next slide is our work plan. Um, so you can see that you know on an annual basis, we conduct emergency room surveys, acute inpatient surveys, but there's always added modules. So the emergency department includes paramedic, ambulance, and then we pivoted to add COVID-19. Acute inpatient maternity, peds, rehab, surgery, medical, um, and we're also now again using COVID-19. So this just shows you our work plan. Some um, rolling cycles, some continuous surveying, some point in time, but always with the guiding principle of repeating surveys so that we can trend data over time. Next slide. So all of our results are posted either on the Ministry of Health Public Facing website, and you can see then you'll get these slides afterwards, so you can go and check that out yourself. They include a descriptive summary report as well as static detailed narrative and graphical reports as well as storyboards, which are one pager. Next slide. We also have a uh, website, bcpcm.ca. Um, again, with gratitude to the BC Support Unit for the funds to develop a website that um, provides tools and resources originally geared to researchers so that as uh, record level data would become available to researchers from our provincial initiative, they would um, have a, a resource to be able to help them to be able to use that data. But you'll also see in the tab across the top, the DART. And so what I'm gonna focus on now is the DART, next slide, Rick, which is our dynamic analysis and reporting tool. We're currently using a second version of the DART um, and we're in the development of our third version. Next slide. So what is the DART? Um, the DART actually came to be as a result of criticism that when we produced our static reports, it was a lag time. The lag time was sometimes three months, sometimes six months, sometimes even longer as we did statistical weighting 
case mix adjustments and other analyses that were expected um, in the reports that would be used for public accountability. And the criticism was that you're not really providing data that supports us for local QI. And so what we saw was a move backwards to homegrown tools that were being used for real-time data collection. And I could do a whole webinar on the um, pitfalls of real-time data collection, but the, probably the most important one is the one that Rick referred to, which is um, patients uh, telling us that they have a fear of retaliation when they're providing data in real time to a provider who they're still dependent on to provide care. The other thing in British Columbia is we've had a lot of focus on looking at continuity across transitions in care. And if you're asking somebody at the point of discharge how well they feel prepared for their discharge, they may feel incredibly well prepared, but then after when they um, return home and all of the plans that were the best made plans of mice and men actually start falling apart because people didn't anticipate things that um, these things uh, can be very problematic. So what we've come up with is I think what we believe um, and what evidence has shown is the best of all worlds. So the DART provides de-identified aggregate scores of quantitative data as well as qualitative comments from feedback that have been provided by our patients in response to our provincially coordinated surveys, but the data goes into the DART within two days of the survey being completed. So there's no adjustment that happens with this data. It's available in what we call close to real time. So we're still letting patients retrospectively uh, evaluate their care within one to three weeks of an encounter with the healthcare system. And within two days of them completing the survey, the data goes into the DART. Next slide, Rick. So the features of the DART, as I said, close to real time um, tracking of patient experiences um, and we're evolving to include the promise data as well. 24 seven access by anyone from any computer anywhere in the world with data that's available at the provincial level, at program levels, at regional levels, at facility levels, right down to the point of care. It allows um, individuals that are users of the DART to do custom queries and cross tabs and to export their results, and they can do searches on patient comments for qualitative analysis. The caveat is that until the survey study that's in the field is closed, the scores will change from day to day. Um, so I said, we upload the data to the DART every um, Monday and Thursday. So if you check back on um, Thursday, the scores that you pulled on Tuesday might be different, um, but people understand that as part of our orientation training. The scores have not undergone any statistical adjustments. They're always unweighted, whereas when we do our final static reports, the scores are weighted to adjust for disproportional sampling and to the population universe. The other thing is that it's important to consider the number of responses. The end size may be small, and that's not just important in terms of reporting, but also in terms of the interpretation of the data. Next slide, Rick. So um, accessing um, the DART, I've already said, no personal identifiable data designed for QI and to answer descriptive questions. Anyone, even you in Saskatchewan, can become a DART user. I'll talk about that in a minute. I've already said the data is not weighted and the results are available and close to real time as compared to what I've said about our static reports. Next slide. And for those of you that are interested, um, we also have a very rich set of data assets in the British Columbia Ministry of Health um, Central Data Warehouse Health Ideas where raw data from all of our sector surveys is available. It does include weight. It's useful for exploring research questions for asking descriptive and inferential questions. Um, you can apply directly to the Ministry of Health um, for access and any researcher can access that data through POP Data BC with the caveats of what's involved in getting access, your research ethics board, approved research project, et cetera. Next slide, Rick. So if you're interested in accessing the DART, and I'm gonna give you a really quick um, just a static slide overview, but we have a really great, if I do say so myself, orientation video, again, with thanks to the support unit for funding that. 
Um, it's posted at the URL here. It's 26 minutes. In order to get access to the DART, um, all you need to do is watch the video, complete our registration form, and agree to our terms of use. And then on an annual basis, we'll reach out to you just to confirm that you still wish to have continued access, and we'll also do a survey, of course, we'll do a survey to ask you how you've been using the DART and to get your feedback for improving it um, as we implement um, future versions. Next slide. And this is just a little schematic that shows the data flow. This example is a recent survey, outpatient cancer care. So the surveys are completed and received by our data collection vendor. The vendor de-identifies the data. A weekly data cut is uh, sent to our DART host and the DART host uploads the data onto the DART every Monday and every Thursday. So hence the reason why the scores change. Um, and then I'll be showing you on some of these static slides how you can filter results, and in this case, by type of cancer, by the date of the treatment, by the date that the survey was completed, um, as well as looking at the tailored qualitative themes arising from the, um, the uh, open text comments that patients provide. Next slide. I think the next slide is, uh, oh yeah, and it's constantly evolving. So uh, again, I'm really proud of the fact that when we get feedback, you know, we've made these changes already. We've provided hover text. We, you can now export tables to Excel. You can download pages as PDF. You can apply time period filters, demographic filters. You can save queries if you're going back week after week, day after day to look at the results. For a QI project, you can save the query so you don't have to replicate them. There's a resource tab that we've reconfigured to make it easier. And then patient's own words is the tab where we've done keyword search functions and other um, enhancements to um, help people with qualitative analysis. We get 10, next slide, Rick. We get tens of thousands of um, open text comments for every survey that we do. So it's a really rich source of data to illustrate the new numerical results, but also to do qualitative uh, analysis in its own right. So this is what the login page looks like. And again, here's the URL to the DART. If you go on there right now, you would get to this page. You wouldn't be able to access it because you haven't uh, watched the video and requested access, but uh, you could become a user. Next slide. So once you log in, um, then you agree to the terms of service and the terms of service tell you that you may be able to drill down to an end size of one, but you may not use that information in any way um, that would um, allow you to identify the individual. Um, you may publish uh, reports, but they need to be uh, submitted to us with a 30 or 45 day, I can't remember. Lead time will never stop you from publishing, even if you're a member of the media, um, but we um, may uh, give you feedback on your interpretation. Next slide. So then you would get to the um, second landing page, and here you see the directory. These are all the sector surveys that are currently available in the DART. So they go back to our acute inpatient 2016-17 survey. That survey is going back into the field, so there'll be another um, tab going in shortly. You'll see ED 2018, and again below it, ED 2021. Um, so the ED 2021 um, survey, the, as soon as we went into the field, the tab was up and available. And then on the side, you can see administrative, um, the survey materials, um, as well as resources. Next slide. So I'm just going to really whip through these quickly. So Rick, have your finger on the on the trigger here. <laughs> okay, so survey instruments, so you can see on the sidebar on the right-hand side. Next slide, Rick. And then here you'd be able to download. Um, the particular survey instrument. So if it's a uh, proprietary tool, we would let you know. Next is the resources and a whole host of uh, resources here. Next slide, Rick, um, where you'd be able to see the DART user manual as well as resources for every single sector survey. We even um, post the uh, final results. So here, um, uh, acute, no, it's fine, go ahead, Rick. Um, here you'll see if I wanted to select the ED 2021 survey results. Next slide. Um, again, I get to the um, landing page for the ED 2021 survey, and right away I see a navigation bar. I can go back to the DART directory. Oops, I meant to look back at 2018 first. I can go back. Um, feedback, like I said, we're always trying to evolve the DART and help with any technical issues, um, and then log out. 
You'll also see here that I can select the reporting level that I'm interested in. Am I interested in province-wide or specific health authorities? Am I interested in all facilities or a um, facility within a health authority or selected facilities? And if it's a survey that has um, a lower level, it might also say unit level or point of care. Next slide. Um, so I've already explained this, the reporting level you can see here, I selected Providence Healthcare and I'm interested in Mount St. Joseph Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital. I'd then click go and um, it would take me to whatever tab I'm on and provide me with the information for those sites. Next slide. So the first tab, there are five tabs. The first one is called results for the glass, glance, glance. <laughs> and it provides the global rating questions. Next slide. So this is organized like a carousel, and the first view on the carousel shows all of the global rating questions. So here you can see that there are three global rating questions that ask people whether they were helped by their ED visit, their overall rating of their hospital experience, and whether they would recommend the hospital. Um, and then you can see that this is reported here on a month-to-month -month basis. In some cases, it's every two weeks. Some cases, it's weekly, depending on the sector survey. Next slide. Oh, and you'll see the, uh, never mind, but I'll show it on this slide. The next, um, still the same tab, but it's a carousel, um, provides a run chart. And now here, what I can look at is I can, I'm looking at Surrey Memorial Hospital, I'm looking at Surrey scores. I hover over, and so the hover text comes on, but then you can see the legend below where I can also see the average for all the tertiary facilities, because Surrey Memorial is a tertiary hospital in the peer group structure we have and then I can see the facility average over time. Next slide. Next in the carousel, um, oh, I'm just showing here that you can download any of these into a JPEG, a PDF, et cetera. Next slide. So people will download and they will put them into, you know, a storyboard type of report that they present every week or every month or every quarter. Um, the next, this piece of the carousel shows, we show the top 10 and the bottom 10 scoring questions. So here the score, the highest, scoring questions in the survey at the, whatever the reporting level is at that point. The next one, Rick, is the bottom scoring questions. And then the next one, once we've closed the survey, if we've done a key driver analysis, we post that um, as well so that people can see which are the questions that based on our analysis are the questions that they may wish to focus on um, in terms of trying to move the needle on overall experiences. Next slide. The second tab allows you to explore the questions. So here, I'm going to click on a question that asks, during your ED visit, did the nurses, and we also have the same one for doctors, did the nurses introduce themselves to patients? So this was a question that we added, um, looking at the Kate Granger, hello, my name is initiative that started in the UK, which I know many of the health quality councils, including Saskatchewan, um, um, represent. So here we can see that this is a four point scale question that for this survey we had 14,200 and I can't see what is it, 88 quest, uh, respondents. The top box score was 54% and there will be a run chart. So next slide, Rick, shows that when I click on it, this is what comes up. I see the text fragment, I see the sample size, for the, this would be for the entire province. The top box score, is 53% and the definition of that is always, if I look down, I can see the response distribution for the four point scale. I can see the top box um, score over time looks relatively flat. So if we're trying to improve it, we're not there yet. And then we see a response distribution table. Next slide. Um, this is just showing the same thing as a di different question that shows more variability where you would want to be doing some consideration with your team about, you know, what happened during uh, February um, 17th um, to 28th um, that caused the score to dip. Next slide. I can also compare multiple questions. So if I want to look at more than one question um, at the same time, I can do a keyword search. I'm interested in all the questions that talk about respect. So we had two questions, the one around respectful of culture and tradition, so whether uh, being treated with courtesy and respect. I then click on that, so Rick click, and it'll show that I now get, um, oh, I guess I didn't put that slide in. It would show the, the two questions compared one over the other. The third slide allows, the third 
tab in the DART allows us to apply filters. And so here we can apply filters by gender, by ethnicity, and by age group, as well as discharge date. Next slide. Um, that's the same thing again, just blown up. And it also shows that I can compare um, more than one question. This shows how I would select my different questions. Um, go back. Keep going, Rick. Yep, keep going. Um, and then show how the response does, um, how the, the answers to that would be presented, showing table um, and showing a chart. Next slide. And I can export that to Excel. Next slide. I can save my query. So if this is something that I'm interested in recording on every week or every month, next slide, I can save the query as well. And then I can print uh, the report. Next slide. The step fourth tab, there's five tabs, so the fourth tab, I can actually create tables and charts. So again, I can filter, next slide. I can select more than one question, next slide. And then I get um, my results for the two questions as table, next slide, and um, uh, graphically as well, next slide. And then the final tab is patient's own words, where again, I can search by keywords, um, all the, all the re um, qualitative data that we, re all of the open text responses that we receive, which is the qualitative data, are mapped and coded. They're coded using the dimensions of patient-centered care and other dimensions that we think are important. So for example, we've now added virtual health, we've added COVID-19 so that we can group those questions together. So you can click on that. If you clicked on communication, you'd get a drop down box that would say communication with doctors, communication with nurses, blah, blah, blah. So you can keep you know, peeling the layers of the onion and reduce the number of um, comments, but you can also look for more if you want. Next slide. And then there's valences added. So when we do the masking and the coding, we also then apply a valence. So it's um, positive comment, a negative comment, a neutral comment, or both positive and negative. So that just helps you. Not if you want to do your own coding, you can do your own coding. Next slide. Uh, oh, and then you can uh, filter so that you get only the positive, only the negative. So if you're really wanting to use the comments to illustrate your numerical data, your quantitative data, then this just makes that easier. Next slide. The next slide I think is our frequency um, <laughs> distribution. And this drives me crazy, but it's what our users want. Um, it drives me nuts that people want to use qualitative data and uh, count the number of comments, but people do like to do that. So here's the uh, application that we provided to let them do that. Next slide. And then you can search. Um, so you can put in keywords and then you get only the comments that have um, parts of those uh, words included. Next slide. Um, and then the only thing that we do is that we want to just really encourage people to present a balanced view when they're using comments. I've seen reports where, you know, people will only pu pull all the negative um, comments or only pull all the positive comments. So that's just a reminder when we do our training. Next slide. And that, you know, the comments represent one person's view. Then you log off. Next slide. So if you want more information, I think my key messages are you can become a user of our Dart. The other thing is that there is nothing about um, our Dart that is proprietary. Um, and I'm often asked to do demos of the Dart. And I always tell people you can create your own Dart. It's easy peasy. If there's anything that we can do to expedite so that you can go from zero to 150 a lot faster than we did, um, we, our only caveat would be is that if you do do that, and you find ways to enhance it that you um, close the loop and um, um, help us to improve our own work as well. So I hope that's um, provided a whirlwind uh, tour and an opportunity for you to see how um, this reporting platform augments what we're learning as we advance the science of patient-centered measurement. Thank you. Thanks, Lena, and thanks, Rick. Um, I know we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm just gonna 
um, go through a couple of points on learning health systems. But the first thing I want to start with is one of the things I think is such a great partnership between Rick and Lena is um, when we think about learning health systems, and you'll hear me, hear me remark on this in a moment, is that it's a partnership between the academic space and the applied spaces of the health system space. And, and you see that represented both in Rick's expertise as, a, as someone who comes from the patient-centered measurement field, as well as Lena's experience really trying to figure out how do we use this data um, in a responsible way and apply it to such that it can change decisions for the different stakeholders within our health system. So that wasn't the focus of what we were meant to do in, our, in the early work of the patient, uh, of our SPORE work. But as Chris alluded to early on, as we move forward towards learning health systems, there's this really fantastic foundation in patient-centered measurement in my in my opinion, uh, that, that, that places us uh, well uh, moving forward. Next slide. So just briefly on what is a learning health system, um, this is kind of our visualization. And Amber Huey, who's on the phone with us, has helped pull this, uh, this graphic together. Um, the things that I'll point out with the learning health system is, one, that it's, it's this ability to enable research to influence practice and practice to influence research. And I think that you've heard examples of that, both in what Lena presented with how the data is being used to inform um, the, 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 the practice and the decision makers, but also as Rick has um, indicated in some of the projects that have been funded is how do we use research on important gaps and evidence to really drive um, where we go from, uh, from the practice field. Um, the other component is that we're continuously and routinely improving, and there have been 10 projects funded in patient-centered measurement, and how we then integrate the learnings from those projects and continue to advance the field, because 10 projects isn't nearly enough to answer all the questions that might exist in um, patient-centered measurement. That data is collected at all stage, the stages of, of care delivery, um, that it's regular, regularly reviewed and analyzed to improve care. And I think you saw some examples of, of how the um, patient center measurement team are using the data to inform the work that's happening there. And most importantly, and I think speaking to the support unit audiences, is that it's in partnership with patients to implement the most effective changes in care. And I actually think in Canada and across the four um, funded work, we're well poised to really think not just as learning health systems, which has traditionally taken the lens of the health system, but more patient-oriented or person-centered learning health systems, because it really does ensure that patients are partnered in the work that we do moving forward. Um, next slide. So, so why do, does patient-centered measurement advance the learning health system? I think you heard this in both what Rick and uh, Lena laid out, that it, it, it's new data really to the system that, that brings the lens of the patient versus thinking about the clinical metrics or the administrative metrics that we often easily capture, and I, I say that um, not in a light way, um, as part of routine care delivery. It brings in new information that reflects what the patient is experiencing, what the patient is telling us, or the person is telling us about their care experience. And so in this manner, it's aligned with the quadruple aim that thinks about patient experience, but it also has to help us think about the, the fourth part of the quadruple aim in terms of the, the provider um, experience and making sure that we're not adding more data to an already data intense field. And um, so how do we think about using this information to improve efficiency of the care that's provided? Um, and then the, the, the other point that I would call out is that it allows us to look at a person's experience and health journey outside of the, the brick and mortar walls of our institutions or the virtual walls, as we've noted um, these past uh, couple of years, is that, is that it's expanded under the context of the pandemic, which shows us more information about what a person's experience is when they're not um, just in the healthcare setting. Next slide. So while there's this great opportunity, there's also a lot of learning that needs to still occur in patient-centered measurement. So if we think about the types of data that can inform the um, improvement cycles within healthcare, patient-reported outcomes and patient-reported experience measures add new data to the healthcare, um, uh, the, the space for quality improvement for evaluation and for research. But we still have a lot of learning to understand how does this data actually improve care or what in unintended consequences come from implementing this um, into care experiences. So I think one of the things that Rick might have called out um, when he was talking about the technology aspect, as we've gone to virtual and as we've captured this information virtually, who might we be missing? Um, are we actually alienating people by 
uh, putting questionnaires out where, in fact, they want to provide their experiences in a different uh, different way. And Lena's representation of how we can use more text-based um, uh, content to expand our learning and our knowledge um, provides us a new opportunity moving forward. Um, there needs to be governance around patient-centered measurement data that I don't think has, has traditionally existed in health systems. We've thought about governance around clinical data, but as we are bringing patient and person voices into the system, how do we govern that um, appropriately? How do we ensure responsible use and making sure that people understand how that data is used both to inform their care, but also enhance care for others? Um, and then the last point that I would say, is, and I alluded to this before, is that patient engagement and the design and use of data is needed um, because it, in, it influences the workflow, not just of clinical teams, but of patients as well. And so we have to give good, um, good thought and um, study to the best processes for um, involving patients and, and the public, quite frankly, in the work that we do. Next slide. So I'm, I'm going to close on this, and I, I do apologize for, for rushing. I'm going to post one, one quick thing in the chat. Um, some of my prior work um, in the U.S. Uh, was really focused on how do we think about systems and this incorporation of new data into workflow. So the website that I've just linked to is um, looking at how we provide good governance. How do we integrate and use data to inform the work we're doing, but also inform um, what's working and what's not working? And then how do we start to think responsibly about the data visualizations that we put out to make the data actionable, as Rick alluded to. Um, and so in this context, I actually think that learning health systems can benefit from from patient-centered measurement and that we can understand more about the person experience and improve care in a way that reflects the person's values um, and needs um, in the point of care. But I also think the learning health system model is important for patient-centered measurement because as we collect this information and as we analyze this data, we also need to learn about the data and improve that, bring that information back to the learnings that we're, we're doing both in research and in practice. So I think that um, that symbiotic relationship where it's research informing care and care informing research, um, it's a real um, great opportunity for this um, respective field of work. Um, with that, I'm going to bring us to a close and would welcome any questions um, from the audience. Um, and Chris, I think I'll turn it back to you for that piece, recognizing we just have about 15 minutes left. Yeah, for sure. A uh, big thank you to everyone for presenting today. Uh, that was really great. And we do have a few minutes for questions here. Uh, so if anyone has questions, then feel free to uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand and we can come unmute you and uh, give you the opportunity to ask. I guess while we're waiting for people to put them into the chat, one of the questions we had before the presentation, and I think you touched on it a little bit, but just want to make sure that you, uh, there's no more ideas to bounce around, um, but was how, how can caregivers benefit from patient-centered measurement? Uh, well, who wants to respond? <laughs> Rick, you want to start and then I'll add to that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, in the um, in BC, we we have the BC um, uh, Caregivers Association, and uh, we actually work closely with them. Um, this is a, a big question. I think there's there's a lot more attention that needs to be brought to caregivers. But how can they benefit? Well, one is uh, patient centered measurement or caregiver data. So we're using the term patient here to refer to caregivers then. Uh, so about their own healthcare experiences and their own healthcare outcomes um, uh, can help bring attention to their needs. And so this can be used um, at, at, at kind of provincial levels to uh, inform allocation of resources and decisions to be made around the needs of, of caregivers. But it can also be incorporated at points of care. Uh, we'll actually do a study on that, feeding caregiver data directly into the points of care environment so that they, because they're part of the circle of care surrounding the patient, of course. Um, it's kind of obvious in a way, but in order to support uh, the caregiver, we need to know how they're doing. And so we have a patient uh, a project led by um, uh, um, uh, well, at the BC Cancer uh, Agency, um, focusing on integrating caregiver data 
in uh, into uh, the clinical context. It's by um, uh, oh, Pusha Howard and uh, Michael McKenzie. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Nina, did you have more to add? Yeah. Or, well, that's. Right? I it was Fuchsia and Michael's uh, project that I was hoping you would highlight because we funded yeah. that using our SPORE funds and we're really excited. We were really excited when we got that proposal that included um, the perspective of uh, caregivers who are supporting cancer patients. I guess the other thing I also, Rick and I are like such mind meld. Um, we did a lot of work with the BC Caregivers Association in developing a module of questions so remember I said in British Columbia, we use ready to wear tools. So when we went to um, develop a primary care survey, we did a review of the literature, but we identified gaps, in fact, five gaps and caregiver distress, of people supporting um, patients who go to primary care was one area. And we had a task group that worked with us for a year um, looking at how could we incorporate into a survey instrument questions that ask, are you a primary caregiver for another person? And what is that experience like for you when you seek primary care for yourself and when the person you support seeks primary care? Are you included in the conversations? What's the impact of privacy? All of these things, it was a really exciting piece of work and we'd be really happy, I don't know who asked the question, but we'd be really happy to share both the um, summary, it's on the support unit website of uh, Fuchsia and Michael's project, and, but also the summary of the work we did with um, the development of the uh, caregiver distress module for our primary care survey. I would just add to this because I completely agree with what um, Rick and Lena have indicated, especially Lena, to your point about what are the ways in which we can better understand who is a caregiver and what impact does that have on them. Um, I'm going to also wear the future directions hat of as we expand the patient generated health data element, Rick, as you indicated, the different types of information we can capture outside of the healthcare visit. Some of the work that, um, that I've done in the past in talking to people who track information or report information respective to patient report outcomes, for example, talk about how as a caregiver or care partner, the, um, the requirement to capture data about the person that they're helping to support through their care journey, it can change the relationship. And so there's some of these unintended consequences of as we track more information and it's one more thing for people to look at or capture and provide, what does that do to the dynamics of the relationships people have outside of healthcare? Because it, it puts a bigger um, uh, uh, light or shines a bigger light on their experience as a patient when that may not be the only thing that they wanna think about. So, so I think in terms of areas to explore and understand is, um, how does more data, the capture of data outside of the healthcare visit, impact other parts of our lives that we might not be thinking about in the moment? So, um, just to, to throw a different lens there um, as well. Thanks. Uh, a few comments in the chat. One saying thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, you've set up, set up an amazing system that we can learn a lot from. Uh, and then another saying, wow, thank you. Excellent work. I want this in Manitoba. Um, so I think that there, <laughs> there'll be a lot of people jealous of the systems that BC has set up. Um, one of the things I was wondering about is it sounds like there's a lot of amazing work going on to um, involve provincial level decision making and quality improvement projects through the DART system. I'm wondering if there's been any consideration or any work given done or consideration given to um, having this information available to kind of support um, decision making at the patient level. So the interaction between uh, patients and their their primary care providers and their clinicians to um, inform that kind of decision making. Well, I guess I, I'll start by saying, you know, that that's the dream. I have a dream. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to work towards that. I think the first provincially coordinated survey where we are likely to see that happen will be total hip and knee replacement in that um, we're going to be doing um, data collection at different points of the patient journey. So pre-op, less than eight weeks prior to a scheduled hip or knee replacement, and then post-op, 
potentially um, after discharge from hospital, three months, six months, and then nine to 15 months later. And we're looking at using the DART to have a sign-in area for surgeons to be able to go in and get the results for their own physician, uh, their own patients. The question I think that we're grappling with is, should we be leveraging existing, you know, Cerner and uh, electronic medical record systems and surgeon and physician offices um, that are available to primary care uh, teams, that sort of thing, or do we continue to expand the DART? So we're not quite sure where to go with that. Um, again, it's the difference between real-time data collection and what we've learned through our engagement and advancing the science of patient-centered measurement about the risk of asking for information in real time versus the availability of that information to actually inform clinical practice decision-making right in the moment. So I'll turn it over to Rick, because I know you've done some work, um, I think, in the home care space with having data available at the point of care. Sure, thanks. Uh, there's been a number of projects going on in BC, uh, both under the umbrella of the, the patient-centered measurement methods cluster, but also uh, independence from that. Um, but I think uh, just bringing up, and, and so it has all to do, of course, with integration. We have a project in, in interior health led by Francis Lau that was just presented last week. You could find a recording on our website. Uh, that has to do with integration of other points of care into an EMR. Um, and, um, but one of the challenges has to do, I think, also with the first theme that I talked about. And that, so we, we accentuate the safety themes, but there's also the patient-driven themes. And of course, our EMR systems are, by definition, not patient-driven. They're healthcare provider driven, the healthcare provider who accesses and controls who has access to what. So I think what we're seeing internationally, actually, if we look at countries uh, like Denmark, for instance, um, and what we've also then the project that Lena was referring to in terms of our home care projects, what if we turn that around and use an EHR system, electronic health record system that is managed by the patient and the patient controls as to who has access to what piece of information. And so I think we need a, a bit of a, a culture shift happening here. Um, EHRs where patients are the driver's seats are widely available, uh, but they're not the norm at this point. Uh, and, and so I think that's part of the barrier of, of integrating a point of care. Um, and it's, it's, you know, relates to one of the priority themes identified in our province. So I'm happy to share lots more about that. Thanks. One more comment that came in that said, I think that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's any other, uh, I don't see any other hands raised or questions coming in. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, uh, I just typed that it was a great idea. I'm speaking as a patient. Yeah. And I've been, uh, <clears throat> trying to access my medical data now for uh, as long as I've been in the healthcare system, which is yeah. uh, from, I don't know, it's a long time. And uh, unfortunately here in Newfoundland, what you described here in your BC is like a fantasy to the healthcare system in Newfoundland. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I think uh, it's a great idea, the concept, and uh, giving pa patients uh, a voice in the design and uh, planning of any research, I think, is is very important. Right? Yeah. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the patient is. It's just get the patient involved. And it seems like the old system of uh, depending on the, your general practitioner to book an appointment to see your blood work is still thriving here in the Eastern province. But uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. Thanks to people that you, thank you. Thanks for sharing. You're Thanks welcome. Austin. Um, we have one, probably time for one last question. And we do have one more coming in the chat um, asking, could you please speak to the supports that are required to cross the gap from knowing through patient reported data to doing or acting on it. 
Uh, you mentioned the importance of data visualization. Do health systems need to do more to facilitate uptake of data for evidence-based decision making? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one um, and say yes, um, because um, training on patient report outcomes, how to interpret that information doesn't occur in most medical um, training. Uh, in, in having done some work in orthopedics, they get on-the-job training and they learn it through research. But Rick can speak to this in terms of how measures are developed, who they're developed for, if it's meant to be at the individual or the aggregate um, level in terms of which that data is pooled. Um, it, there are really critical areas that need to be explored. Um, and understood before you use the data because it could then be used irresponsibly, even though that's not the intent. So I think that it's it's making sure people have adequate training um, and that the information is, is is well applied and well captured as suited. But um, Rick and Lena can can certainly have um, added thoughts to that as well. Well, my response would be yes. <laughs> as well. I, I've often referred to the idea of a knowledge translation crisis um, uh, in the sense of, you know, we, we actually have for almost five decades of work uh, on use of patient reported data. This is not a new idea, um, but how to do it well remains still quite, quite, uh, quite a challenge. And um, uh, I think working with the stakeholders, uh, finding out how to report and how to be, how to use the data is, is key. It, it, I think it's another presentation. We could go on about it quite a bit, but Lena, would you like to add a few words yet? I, I was just gonna say, I wonder Rick, whether you could put into the chat, the URL for the Healthy Quality of Life uh, right. website. Yeah. And people can get to it through our bcpcm.com but um, Rick and uh, Kara Schick Marikoff led a project, our team was involved as well, um, where we interviewed um, uh, government leaders, um, decision makers in healthcare organizations, so managers, clinicians, patients, um, across the entire spectrum to ask them what would they need to better be able to work with data that we collect. So um, Rick and his team developed some really wonderful resources and I think it'd be really great to, um, if you click on that, I think you'll agree there's some videos, there's some um, storyboard type posters. It's really great information. Yeah. Thanks, that takes us right to two o'clock. So big thank you to all our presenters today. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who attended uh, and to Brittany, who was managing the behind the scenes side of things for this and, and did a lot of the background planning. Um, just so everyone who's atten in attendance knows, all attendees will be sent a survey following the event. Uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on the event today and how we can improve it for future events. Um, so please take a few minutes to complete that. Uh, and that'll wrap up our workshop for today.